Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter to all of our APCH friends and family from Tim and Kathy Messick. From our home to yours, we wish you the special joys of this Easter Sunday and also in the days and weeks ahead. Blessings to each of you and once again, Happy, happy Easter. Easter. I want to use this opportunity to say hello and Happy Easter to all my APCH family. Wishing you Happy Easter and all the best. Stay safe until we meet again by God's grace. Happy Easter. APCH family, we hope to see you soon. We miss you all. Bye. Happy Easter, Easter APCH. APCH. We miss, miss you all. all. Christ has risen. He's risen indeed. Happy Easter from the Van Olten family. We miss you and hope to see you soon. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Dear church family, I can't tell you how much I miss seeing you, but I'm so grateful for all the opportunities to meet virtually. Have a blessed, peaceful, joyful Easter. Please keep safe and stay healthy. I love you. Greetings, APC8. We miss you, young and old and yeah. in between. Mm -hmm. Which is why we want to say to you, Christos Anviat. Adevarat Anviat. Which means Christ is risen. Is risen indeed. Happy Easter. Happy, happy Easter. Easter. I love to make the children happy. Every year I put on my Easter bunny hat and I'm standing by the door and making the churn big and small, happy. Now I can't do it, so I just want to say I want to wish you all a nice and happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is the best day of the year for us. This is where all things change. The resurrection makes all things new. We're glad that you're with us. Hear the story from the book of Matthew. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. This is my message to you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Will you pray with me? We give you thanks, great God. For the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We praise you for his presence with us. Because he lives, we look for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, nothing present or yet to come, can separate us from your great love made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. the sun, where to stand in the morning, and who told the ocean, you can only come this far, and who showed the moon, where to hide till
Bible reading for today comes from the book 1 Corinthians 15, um, selected passages. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, 
nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, friends of Jesus. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I wish we could say it together face to face, but the Spirit of Christ is with us and joins us. And so, with that gift, let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, all honor and power and glory and dominion belongs to you. So speak through your word. Grow our faith in your resurrection life and let us live to your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Sometimes in life, there are events that change everything. The way you think, the way you live, the way you look at others, the way you see the whole world. The coronavirus epidemic has done that in a significant way. We hope it's only for a season, but it's changed the way we interact, the way we move, the way we disinfect, the way we're concerned. But it is not the dark lord it pretends to be. It too shall die. And there is an infinitely better gift of good news on this Easter Sunday. In the face of sickness and death, and with the news about terrorism and wars waiting in the wings, the Apostle Paul now boldly proclaims to us the event that has changed everything. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He died, he was buried, and he was raised to bodily resurrection life. That changes everything. The way we see the world and each other, the way we look at death and life itself. Don't you know how much joy our bodies give us? Think of it. The wonderful tastes of food and drink. The glorious sights we enjoy with our eyes. The beauty of hearing wonderful birds or orchestras or songs with our ears. A kiss. Oh, okay, for the Dutch, three kisses. A hug, a helping hand, dancing, hiking, playing basketball or a musical instrument, laughing, singing, rejoicing. God has blessed us with bodies which give us so much joy in the midst of challenges for many of us too. And God promises that he will raise our bodies in bodily form, new bodies, even more wonderful than our current, mortal, breakable ones. And since that is true, Paul says, stand firm. Live faithfully in the good news of Jesus Christ. Give yourselves fully to the work that God calls you to for his glory. For one day these imperfect bodies will be perfect, imperishable, immortal, 
fit for eternal existence in the new heavens and the new earth. Rejoice and live well now as we anticipate the eternal life. The Corinthian church, though, was having a bit of a different view. It seems they believed in Jesus' resurrection. That had been preached to them. They heard that from Paul's gospel. But they were being led to believe that this didn't mean necessarily that God's people would be bodily raised from the dead. There's a lot of debate about what actually was going on in Corinth. One important teacher of the church has said this. The most likely idea is that the Corinthians believed that Jesus was raised and then that he with the Father poured out the Spirit of God upon the church. And this was the unique spiritual existence which was given to us. Our bodies would one day finally be destroyed not that they were in themselves bad or evil, but they were, in, they were inferior and beneath us. The idea that the body, a corpse, would be raised was ridiculous to them, even anathema. It was the spirit and the unusual gifts the spirit gives us. That's where life is. But this wasn't the word of the angel at the tomb that we heard. The angel proclaimed an embodied resurrection. Imagine that the angel had said to the two Marys, don't worry, his spirit lives on in you who love him. Or, the ideas that he promoted will grow through all of you, so go tell the disciples to keep up the good work. Or, Jesus' good vibes are all around the world today. Go home and rejoice in that. Ah, it wouldn't have changed the world or the cosmos. Ideas and influence can affect things. It doesn't change things the, world, the way Jesus' resurrection did. What the angels said was that deeply, Physically, a resurrection life had been given to Jesus, the one who was dead but is now reigning over all. He is not here. He is raised from the dead. Tell this to his disciples. He's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Paul recounts so many people who saw him risen bodily in resurrection form from the dead. Peter and his disciples. 500 people at the same time. Jesus' brother James, who was at once not a believer, but soon after the Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit upon the church, James becomes a leader in the church, a believer in Christ and his bodily resurrection. All the apostles, Paul says, saw Jesus at once, the disciples and men and women whom Jesus commissioned to go out and tell the good news. And finally, Paul himself. They all saw an embodied, resurrected Lord. And not only do we have witnesses who have seen the resurrected Jesus, Paul says. If Jesus wasn't raised bodily, if we ourselves are only hoping in him for the life we have right now, then let's go out and party. Why waste our life believing in something that ends when we die? But Christ has been raised from the dead with a resurrection body for eternal life. The first of all the resurrection bodies of all God's people. That being true, now live life new in a brand new way. These bodies will some, in some particular way be transformed, replaced. These bodies, which are susceptible to germs and viruses, sickness and challenging conditions, aging, a body that wears out and finally, for all of us, dies. 
These will be replaced with resurrection bodies fitting for an eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. As the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, with Jesus' resurrection, a new world has opened up in which the all-embracing power of sin and death no longer holds sway. The world we know, the, world's, the world whose loveliness, majesty, fragrance, and teeming life are mocked by death, decay, corruption, and sheer entropy. That world has heard the good news that there is, after all, a way forward, a way into a life yet greater, more beautiful, more powerful than this one. Take away Jesus' resurrection, and all that is put into doubt. Believe the good news of those who saw and experienced this life in the risen Christ. Believe the good news, and all of life changes. On this Easter, may I tell you a story about a resurrection life. What does it look like when in this world we're shaped by a trust in the bodily resurrection of Jesus to eternity and in the future resurrection of us all? How does it change our view of others and of our own lives and of the purpose to which Christ has called us? A pastor and an acquaintance of mine, Mark Laberton, who's the former pastor of the Berkeley Presbyterian Church, which Chad comes from, and who is now president of my alma mater, Fuller Theological Seminary, tells a story of, I think, a beautiful resurrection life in his book, The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor. Listen. Doris explained that she would have had the muffins there, but she'd been kidnapped. That morning, Doris had parked in her usual spot adjacent to the church in Berkeley, got out, and was reaching back inside the car for her basket of oatmeal muffins. As she leaned in, she was powerfully struck from behind and pushed back into the car and across the console into the passenger side. Breathless, a young man jumped into the driver's seat and took off with Doris riding shotgun. That Doris was in her 80s and had had her elegant silver blonde hair done as usual at 11 o'clock on Friday didn't matter at that moment. Suddenly, everything had changed. Mark, this pastor, made his way straight from the church to her tidy apartment. Shaken but steady, Doris greeted him at the door. He, he said that every pastoral corpuscle within him was firing as he leaped at the chance to surround Doris with love and support in the midst of this trauma. But this day, he said, Doris proved to be his pastor more than he could be to her. After he took off in the car, the first thing I did, of course, was to ask him his name, Doris said. Of course, when mugged and kidnapped, start by asking your attacker's name. He said he was Jesse. So I said, Jesse, what are you doing? I'm kidnapping you so we can go to your ATM and get out money from your account, Jesse said to her. So I said, Jesse, why are you doing this? He told her it was because he needed money for drugs. He was addicted and needed a hit. So she just said, well, Jesse, it's a horrible thing to be addicted to drugs. You really shouldn't be a drug addict. It's not the way you should be living in your life. Ah, uh, yes, remember that. When kidnapped, at least make conversation an honest one, Mark says. By then, Doris explained they had arrived at the first ATM machine, and after intimidating her for her password, Jesse jumped out to get the cash. As he sped away to the next branch, Doris said she explained to Jesse that he really needed help, that this drug addiction was much bigger than he was. He needed help from God, who really loved and understood him. After the next branch, Doris told Jesse he also needed an effective drug rehab program. 
Jesse replied he had tried that, but Doris suggested that he needed a better one. Then she said, Jesse, God wants to help you. By the third bank stop, Jesse had hit the daily withdrawal limit from Doris's account. Since she was no longer useful to him, he pulled the car to the side of the road and explained that he was going to leave her there. He had what he needed, he said. But Doris was not done. Jesse, I'm going to pray that you get caught for this because it's wrong and you shouldn't get away with doing this to people. I'm also going to pray that you will be caught so, you, so that I can not only testify that you did it, but so I can plead with the judge to get you into a good drug rehab program. You need to get caught so you can't, can be stopped and helped. You need God to give you the strength to get off drugs and have a better life. Hmm, that sounds like what I would say if I was kidnapped. Jesse was just going to leave me, Doris said. But I couldn't get out of the car because I was so battered and stiff. So Jesse said he would come around to the other side and help me, which I really appreciated, she said. He came around, opened the door, helped me out, held my arm so I could get to the driver's side, and then gave me his arm so I could get into the car. Then he put the seatbelt across me, leaned in, and kissed me on the cheek. So that's what happened, Doris said. Mark, the pastor, with his pastoral adrenaline still rushing, leaned toward her, and with all the empathy he could exude, he said, I'm so sorry this terrible thing happened to you, Doris. It's horrible, it's true, said Doris. But then, without much of a pause, she added, But the really horrible thing is Jesse's addiction to drugs. Mark responded, but it's awful that you should get attacked and kidnapped like this. Well, yes, but why not me, asked Doris. This sort of thing happens every day to thousands of people. There's no particular reason this shouldn't happen to me. Okay, that's true. When Doris finally said, let's pray for my getting over this, but also for Jesse. Mark, the pastor, found himself thinking that he was also in need of prayer as he tried to absorb the conversation. Within a couple of months, Doris was at the police station identifying Jesse. Soon after that, she sat in a witness box at the courthouse. Yes, hello, Jesse, remember me, Doris? I said I was going to pray for this moment, and I told you why. Here we are. Yes, Judge. Jesse was the one, and yes, he did do all those things. And another thing, Judge, Jesse really needs a good drug rehab program so he can get his life back. I know he's guilty, but he also really needs help. Please, Judge. The story ends there. With both Doris and Jesse in the hands of God, and Mark, too. Doris expresses a life standing firm in the confidence of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and the confidence of faith in him right now in this life too. It affects everything. Her love for Jesse, her concern for life itself and eternal life for him, and her lack of worry about her own life. I I'm sure that didn't happen overnight in Doris's life. She obviously grew in faith all through the years, failing and then trying again, winning at some points, growing in Christ. It happens as we all grow in various ways. When we face this pandemic with honest concerns, but an even deeper, more beautiful hope in the resurrection of Jesus for all who will die before him. It happens as, as we loosen our grip on the security in things that we have rather than on our security with God, loosening our grip and becoming generous. It happens as we are surprised by the word of Jesus in Scripture, calling us to something new, something not easy, but then risking it in trust that God's growing resurrection life in us. And it happens as we pray, God, 
What is your work that you have for me to give you glory in all of life? What do you want me to do? And how do you want me to live my daily life at home or work or school and in this community? Then God grows in us resurrection life that faces pandemics with honest awareness, but even deeper, a faith in the resurrected Lord who has us through all things. In the good news of the gospel, Jesus died for all your sins according to the scripture. He was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day. Today, on Easter Sunday as we celebrate it, and all of life is changed. And God has invited all of us, called us, by his spirit within us, led us to believe and to obey. Stand firm. Give yourself fully to the calling of God for you. And let Jesus lead you and me more and more to live the resurrection life forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Living God, grow that resurrection life in us. Pour the beauty and adventure and comfort and challenge and hope and especially a deep and rich love. Pour that into us more and more so we reflect your life through life and death and into eternal life where we'll praise you forever with all your people. In your name we pray, amen.
King 